Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I think we'll get started now. Everybody's got a chance to get some food. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's wonderful to see so many old friends and a few new faces. We have uh, Columbia, insurance industry, New York City, and uh, a few others I don't know, but um, we're happy to have you all here. Uh, this is the second uh, seminar being put on by the uh, Columbia Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate. The, for those of you who are new to us here, um, there's a tremendous amount of, of research going on here at Columbia University on all of its different campuses and, and departments, or many of them anyway, on uh, climate, climate change, and, and particularly uh, our theme for today, which is extreme events, extreme weather events, and how they're related to climate. And so we had the idea in the last couple of years to try to um, integrate some of the different work that's going on um, across the university on this theme, make it more visible externally, as well as uh, do a little intellectual uh, nation building internally and, and stimulate conversations by getting groups of people together to talk about um, our theme, extreme weather and climate. So there's a number of different ways you can do that. You can have workshops, and we've had a couple that are you know, day, one day long or multi-day events, and we're having one on March 9th and 10th. Our, our next one is on severe convection and climate, which means tornadoes and hail and severe thunderstorms and all that, and how those are related to climate. And some of you I know are coming to that. Um, registration's open now on, online on our webpage, extremeweather.columbia.edu. But we also um, have decided to try having seminars, somewhat like a normal academic seminar, where a speaker comes and talks for roughly an hour about some topic, but a little different in the sense that we have it in a big room, we serve food to get people to come, and we make an effort, we send out emails to you know, invite a wide cross-section of people, of whom you're all among them. And so this is the second such that we've done. Radley Horton, who I see in the audience there from GIS, was the first one in November. This is the second one. And judging from the size of the crowd, we're, um, you know, it still seems to be successful. So we'll, we're going to keep doing them for a while longer. The, we'll have a, about a couple per semester. This is the first one for the fall. Uh, uh, excuse me, what is it? Spring semester now. The first one for the spring. Uh, we'll have another one in late March, which will be um, Rebecca Morse from NCAR. Uh, title to be announced, but this is the second one. So that's what we're doing here, and um, and we'll keep doing it as long as, as we can and as long as it's uh, successful. So I hope you'll all um, keep your eye out for the next ones in the series and, and, um, and come, just like you have today. And besides serving lunch, of course, the other thing that makes it um, work is to have really good speakers. So we have one today. And it's Paul O'Gorman from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So Paul uh, comes from Ireland, where he did a bachelor's uh, and master's degree in physics and high-performance computing in the, in the mid and late 90s, and then went to Caltech, where he did his doctorate in aeronautics, um, uh, studying turbulence and other things in that field. But then I met him when he switched um, to climate as he became a postdoc, still staying at Caltech uh, in the early 2000s. Um, sorry, I guess it was mid-2000s by then, uh, working with Tapio Schneider on climate and did a ser really series of very, um, very original and, and, uh, and significant papers on different aspects of climate change, the role of eddies in mid-latitudes, the hydrologic cycle, and then um, went on to a faculty position at MIT where he's been for some number of years and I believe is tenured now. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, congratulations. Very hard to do at MIT. And, um, He's been doing some of really the most innovative and creative uh, theoretical work on the theme of extremes, especially precipitation extremes. Uh, the, the theory of, of what makes precipitation extremes get change as the climate changes uh, and how that relates to what climate models do and, and to the signals we can see in the observations. So it's a perfect fit for our theme. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be an uh, interesting and, and uh, accessible talk. He's a very good speaker. And his theme today in particular is about, includes, among other things, snow, which I think very few theoreticians have really thought seriously about snow extremes. So given that we have one coming up uh, potentially in the next couple of days, it's very apropos. 
But so we're very happy to have Paul here, and I won't speak any longer except to tell you his whole title, which you can all read, but it's Precipitation Extremes, Snowfall, and the Energy Available to Convective Storms in a war Warming Climate. So thank you, Paul, for coming, and, and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think you can probably all hear me. I can hear the amplification, so that's good. And uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here. Um, thanks to Adam and everyone for uh, inviting me. And as he mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, some aspects of extremes and climate change that I've been thinking about. I'm an atmospheric dynamicist, and I also study the hydrological cycle. And so what I, you know, we've got a broad, uh, diverse group of people here. Uh, what I was hoping to do is give you an overview and give you a sense of what we understand and give you some, some uh, increase your understanding, hopefully, of these things from a kind of physical point of view. And that's important also for understanding what's robust uh, um, if we look at observations or climate models, um, how, how much of it is reliable, I guess. Um, so I should mention as well that um, the last part of my talk is in collaboration with my former student, uh, Marty Singh, who's now at, at Harvard. So thanks to him. So I realize this is a little bit small up here, but uh, I'll, I'll describe what's here. So I want to first talk a little bit about impacts. Uh, why are we interested in these extremes? Um, so the ones I'm talking about, precipitation, heavy rainfall, this is a picture here from Texas from last year. There was some flooding there. Um, that's, it seems in a way an obvious example. Um, I'll show you an example from England next, actually. Uh, but actually, the connection from heavy rainfall to flooding, it, it's obvious in the current climate. But when you look at trends, that is not at all obvious, right, because of river management and so forth. So even, even that, the simplest case, is actually quite complicated when it comes to climate and climate change. Uh, then the second one I'll talk about is heavy snowfall. Um, as Adam mentioned, uh, possible uh, urban disruption to worry about uh, coming up this Saturday. I'm particularly I'm taking the train back uh, to Boston, hopefully. Um, this is a picture, I don't know if you can see it, but that's a large mound of snow uh, beside Simmons Hall, which is a dorm in MIT last uh, February. And there's various people making a trek up the mountain of snow. Um, and uh, fortunately for me, uh, in terms of snow shoveling, I actually happened to be on sabbatical in Australia for that uh, record-breaking event, <laughs> although I was a bit sad to miss it since I'd been studying snowfall extremes. Um, <clears throat> so snowfall is a particular case of precipitation extreme, but it, it, it requires special attention in a number of different ways. And then lastly, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about convection. Um, you can think of it as thunderstorms with multiple impacts, such as lightning, hail, uh, flash floods, uh, certain types of tornadoes, and so forth. And I'm going to talk about the energy available to convection. The other part of the story would be wind shear, uh, which is you know, something that's also important. Um, but a lot of the signals we see, at least in um, climate models, come from the energy side. Uh, but I would argue that we still don't really fully understand why the energy available to these convective storms seems, to, seems likely to increase. Um, and I'll give some partial explanation for that. Um, and I, I think that's, a, that's an ongoing research in a very interesting area, too. Uh, so that's the kind of topics I'm going to talk about. Uh, please, if you have any questions or uh, anything isn't clear, just stop me. Uh, I think we have plenty of time, so uh, there's no problem there. OK, so these are the general topic. And so I wanted to start with an example, um, just to kind of ground things. Um, and I'm from Ireland, but this is from a, a nearby flooding event that happened in um, England. And so what, what's shown here is, is a time series. It's in November of 2009, I believe. Of on, the, on the bars show the rainfall. And then the black line that's overlaid on it is the uh, stream flow on a particular river, the River Eden. And so this is a very local view of an extreme event that caused a lot of flooding and disruption in this area. And what was nice, this is a paper by Lavarza et al., um, is that they then step back and look at, well, what was happening in the atmosphere at that time, right? Um, and so I think right in the middle here, I'm going to show some more graphs that correspond to this big peak here. Um, and so here, here is what was happening, just a broad scale view over the Atlantic sector. Here is the uh, surface pressure. 
Um, and so there's a low here and a high here, leading to flow along this, this line um, straight at that flood, which is a little dot here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Um, that is where that hydrograph came from. And so basically, the flow is encouraging uh, water vapor and transport from the low latitudes. And that you can see that water vapor here in this long tendril. This is the uh, specific humidity at 900 hectopascals, so low level water vapor measure. And so you see what's called an atmospheric river. And by construction, it's exactly pointing at this one river site uh, in, uh, in part of England. And, and that, now, you might be tempted to think, OK, the water vapor is coming from here and just kind of uh, steadily progressing north until it hits, it hits there. That's not actually, these rivers are, these atmospheric rivers, there's two rivers involved here. The atmospheric river, they don't actually behave like that. They form from a combination of cyclones. It could be one cyclone or more than one propagating northward, generating the river. But nonetheless, they're associated with a lot of flooding on the west coast of, of the US and also in the UK, for example, with almost all major flooding events in the UK are associated with these kind of rivers. Um, and then here, the last one is a satellite imagery showing cloud liquid water, I believe. And you can see here the gaps are just gaps from the satellite coverage, but similarly, this uh, stream headed straight for that area. And we could think of many more examples of uh, major precipitation events, flooding events. And the question we want to ask is, how do these and other types of events respond to, to climate change, right? Um, and the first thing to do, and um, I wouldn't have been able to show you results like this um, you know, 10, years or so, 10 years or so ago, but there's been a wonderful um, development uh, in the kind of observational extremes field where we can now look at things globally and say what's happening. I should say in precipitation extremes, we can now look at things globally and say what's happening to extremes. And this is very recent. Um, there's been a few papers that do that. If I was giving this talk 10 or 15 years ago, I would have had to point to regional studies. Sometimes they were brought together, but they weren't done systematically. And so now we can kind of say, OK, what are happening to precipitation extremes globally? And so this is a, a graph to show you where, where the data comes from. Um, so it's all land-based in this case. Um, and there's various dots. Um, and part of showing this is just to show you it's highly inhomogeneous, right? So we, we have loads of data in certain areas like the US and Europe, and then huge spans where there isn't much data. And that's very important to keep in mind. Now, the people who have very good eyesight uh, will probably, I don't know if anyone can do this, but uh, there, there's different dots. Don't worry, I'll show you a, a easier to read graph in a second. Uh, some dots are blue and red. And the, the coloring indicates the relationship with global mean surface temperature. Um, over, it had to be, for these records, they have different lengths, but it was from 1900 to 2009. And, to be part of this analysis, there had to be more than 30 years of data. I think the median length of data is about 53 years or so. Um, and so if it's blue, that means there's a positive association with global mean surface temperature. Uh, the analysis itself is reasonably complex using uh, extreme value theory, a generalized form of extreme value theory. Um, but the basic point is that when the global mean surface temp temperature went up, the extreme precipitation extremes at that area went up. And the extreme here is just the annual maximum precipitation rate. Um, then the red is where it's negative, and open, there's some that are just open symbols, there's no relationship, and then there's a few that are gray with no, uh, the, just the length of record was too short to do the analysis. And, what I can tell you is that there's more blue than red, but there are red, right? So some regions have shown decreases, and that, again, is important to remember. If you're in any one location, there can be decreases. It's not like everywhere goes up, and this is just due to the internal variability of whether that particular region is hit by a storm. However, if we average this uh, latitude by latitude, that's one way to look at the signal, you get this graph. Um, and so it's the... The y-axis here is the percentage increase in the annual maximum daily precipitation rate um, per degree Celsius warming, where that degree Celsius is global mean warming. That's just what the covariate they used. And what you can see is that it's positive almost at all latitudes. So that's the black dashed line, with some variation. 
Um, the shading show is a statistical test. How significant was that change or that relationship with global mean surface temperature? Wherever the dashed line is above that shading means it was significant. And so what's important here is that in wide regions of the northern hemisphere over land, there has been a statistical significant relationship of stronger um, annual maximum daily precipitation rate. Um, and so ex precipitation extremes have been increasing with warming at almost all latitudes, greater than zero, and statistically significant over a wide range. And it's good to go back to these dots and say, well, this is in fact the latitudes where you would expect to get reliable results because there's so many uh, observations in that region. Whereas in the tropics, which is a very interesting region for tropical precipitation, uh, for precipitation extremes, there's very, very few dots. Um, and so that'll be a problem. But I will just note that to the extent this, there is data, it is pretty, there's a pretty high sensitivity in the tropics, but it may be unreliable for that reason. Okay. So the precipitation extremes have been increasing with warming at all, almost all latitudes. Um, and I, I would argue that this is a successful prediction from climate model simulations about 20 years ago in the sense that this data, this kind of analysis, observational analysis, had not been done at the time when this, these kind of papers were written in the early 90s. And I actually came across this paper first when um, Justin Gillis, who is a New York Times uh, journalist who's here somewhere over there, uh, emailed me and asked me, how long ago have we known that um, uh, precipitation is extreme, increase with climate warming, increase in intensity? And so we had some back and forth, and I think he probably found this paper by Gordon et al. And they said, well, you know, it was a very crude model. They used a climate model with four vertical levels. So to represent the entire atmosphere, you've only four numbers at a given location, right? Incredibly crude, but crude. But they argued the frequency of high rainfall events increases, and the return period, equivalently, the return period decreases markedly. And I think they, they argued physically that this was happening because the atmosphere was becoming more unstable as the atmosphere got warmer. And I think that is not why the extremes were increasing, but they did get the right result that the extremes were increasing. Um, and we can talk about that some more. So this, this result has been around a long time, over 20 years, probably more. Um, but uh, only now, I think, in the last decade, have we been seeing in observations you know, on a global scale that that's happening. Now, why is it increasing, and wh why, why was it not the instability? I think it was simpler than that. Um, so the basic uh, equation here is showing how what amount of water vapor in the atmosphere relates to temperature. So the vapor pressure on the left, the pressure of water vapor, is just the product of the relative humidity, what, which we're all familiar with. Uh, which could be in percent, and then multiplied by the saturation vapor pressure, which conveniently enough is just a function of temperature. So this part we know really well. The relative humidity can change, and in fact I'm going to give a talk tomorrow about how it does change over land near the surface, but it stays roughly constant if you integrate vertically, um, and it's just not, it can't compete with the saturation vapor pressure. And so the vapor pressure goes up with warming. Um, this is something we're very sure about and we have observed. And so the simplest expectation from that is that the intensity, how much rain you get on a, on a given day, for example, or in a given hour or five minute period, say, scales or increases with the near surface water vapor amounts uh, in the lower part of the atmosphere at about six or 7% per, per degree Celsius. And this idea has been out there in the literature for a long time. Um, however, there is, that's not the whole story. So these are the caveats to that. And I'm gonna show you an example from a climate model where that doesn't work out, just to, to show you it's not always the case. But what, what else matters? Well, the vertical profile of the, of the upward moving air in the extreme event in the atmosphere that will determine how much convergence and divergence of air there is. And that, that matters. It's not just the near surface part that matters. Then those winds in the storm can change. Pretty obvious, but nonetheless, that's true. And then lastly, the one um, probably has got the least attention is the, what we would call microphysical aspects. So what's happening in detail in the cloud, how, what's happening with ice and liquid and so on. It's really detailed stuff, um, affects precipitation extremes also. But more on the kind of, not for daily as much as for five minutes or hourly, 
if you were asking what, how are hourly precipitation extremes changing, then this is really important. And that's because, um, actually, we were just talking about this, uh, or a related topic at the table there earlier. Uh, the microphysics is complicated. It has a lot of temperature dependencies. Um, various processes depend on temperature. And um, it can make a big difference. The simplest one is, is that as you get warmer, more of the water in the column is going to be in the form of liquid rather than ice. And the liquid, with some exceptions, will fall faster, uh, fall faster than snow, for example. Then there's grout pool. Hail is, is different. But there is a dependency on how fast the hydrometeors are falling. If they take longer to fall to the surface, more things can happen to them, and it'll be more spread out in time. And this affects the precipitation rate, and it affects how precipitation responds to climate change. Again, though, for shorter durations. Um, and so that's something we've been looking at in this paper. If you're interested, I can send it to you. Um, OK, so those are the caveats. And so in fact, if you look at climate models, global climate models, um, which are our main tool in some ways for looking at climate change, um, as well as observations, this, this is the scaling with the amount of water vapor only really applies, or we know it only applies at least at, at mid and high latitudes. And that's where that Gordon paper I mentioned earlier looked at uh, from 20 years ago. So here is showing the sensitivity, similar to what I talked about earlier, the percent change in a precipitation extreme intensity per degree Celsius warming. Um, in the mid latitudes, this is versus latitude in degrees. Here it's maybe 5 or 6% per degree Celsius. Um, but if you, that's the median, oh, I should say there's 15 different models from different uh, parts of the world included here, uh, all with different representations of the atmosphere. Um, the the mo mi min and maximum of those is shown in the dotted line, and they're pretty narrow, close together in the mid-latitudes. So it doesn't matter which model you use, you get the same answer, basically. In the tropics, however, you get close to zero in one model and 30% per Kelvin in another, which would be disastrous if that was the case. And the median is shown here, but it's, you know, it's not very meaningful with this big range. And that is because the winds in those storms that were causing those rainfall extremes in the tropics changed as the climate changed. And they changed in different ways in different models. So that's a caveat, a pretty big one. We don't really know what's going on in the tropics. Um, I made an effort to narrow this uncertainty down using observations. So this is talking about long-term climate change. But you could also say, well, we've got an El Nino this year. That'll affect precipitation extremes and, and is doing so. Um, we can look at how that happens in models and look at how it happens in observations. We've, a lot of, we've got good records of different El Ninos, La Ninas. Use that to rule out some of these models. If they're doing this wrong, if they're getting the wrong rainfall response uh, for El Nino, we're not going to trust them for longer term climate change. And so if you do that, you get this estimate here in the black line with a 90% confidence interval. And so it, it doesn't change the answer in mid and high latitudes, but in the tropics, um, it narrows things considerably. And what I think is interesting as well is that it, it allows for a stronger response in the tropics um, for reasons that we don't understand. So it, the confidence interval is wide enough that we're not sure of that. But basically, it seems that from this and some other work that tropical precipitation extremes may be more sensitive to warming than middle altitude ones. And that's certainly plausible, very different dynamics in the atmosphere going on there. but. Um, uh, intriguing result and could have a lot of implications. Uh, if you remember, if we go back to the observations, uh, there wasn't very many observations in the tropics, basically. So it's a problem area. And the ones we had, there's this spike, but that could be due to shifts in the rain belt in the tropics. It's not really clear. Um, OK. OK, so that was precipitation extremes. In a way, that's one of the things we understand pretty well, notwithstanding this tropical problem. And that could, I should mention that could also be true for summer in the, in the middle altitudes, um, although that's not been shown yet. Um, but what about snowfall? Uh, snowfall is definitely a special case, right? Um, 
How, and I'm going to talk about daily snowfall extremes. I mean, how much snow falls in a day? Uh, you, the event in Boston last February would be more a monthly uh, extreme event, but I'm just going to talk about daily snowfall events. Um, how do they respond to climate change? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to, I should as well, because this is an overview type talk, I'm not going to mention the observations here. But to suffice to say, there are observations of snowfall. Um, but they don't give you a clear picture like, the, um, like for the precipitation extremes in general I showed earlier, because they're just in small regions, typically. Uh, and there's a lot of variability. And it, I don't expect the signal in snowfall extremes to appear till another 20 years or so from anthropogenic climate change. Um, so I'll go straight to the simulations. And we compare a warm climate in the future, so these are projections into the future with the control climate in the historical period. And I'll use 20 climate models um, and average over them, but that won't affect the results. I won't show results from each model. They tend to be pretty consistent. Um, these are in mid, mid and high latitudes where the precipitation extremes response is pretty consistent in the models. So we trust them for the precipitation extremes. Um, it's daily snowfall in liquid water equivalent. That's also important, right? So that's how much liquid water you would get out of that amount of snow that fell, rather than the actual depth of snow, which depends on the type of what this, the nature of the snow and also uh, the temperature, which affects the density. Uh, or uh, many things affect the density, I should say. And then lastly, I'm going to measure the extremes by the 20 year return value, which is a fairly standard uh, measure using a, a GEV distribution. OK, so first I'll talk about the mean snowfall. So this would be how much snowfall falls in a given year or in a given season. And then I'll contrast that with the extreme snowfall. So this is a map uh, for these models of the ratio of snowfall in the warm climate compared to the control climate. So where it's 1, there was no change. Okay. And so the red, the above one is these yellow and orange colors. Below one is blue, blue colors, like so. And, um, and it's, I haven't done it everywhere. I've just done it everywhere where it snows enough that you can do this analysis uh, kind of reliably. And what you'll notice is at very high latitudes, say over Greenland here, parts of Siberia, where it's extremely cold, um, there are, are increases in snowfall. So basically, it's so cold that you warm things up a bit. It's still cold enough to snow a lot of the time. And you have stronger, uh, heavier precipitation, so you get more snowfall. Whereas in a lot of the rest of this map, um, you've got the blue colors, which means decreases in mean snowfall. Um, and there, what's happening is you're just changing over from, say, rain to snow because of the temperature increase. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so mean snowfall decreases due to the change in precipitation type, except where you're very cold to begin with. Um, now here's the extremes, same kind of map. Uh, so, but now you'll notice it's quite different. Now these are 20 year return values, so that's the amount of snowfall that falls, not the frequency. I'll mention frequency a bit later. Um, and you'll see it's mostly this kind of green color, which means no change. It's about one, a ratio of the warm climate versus the cold climate of one. And so basically, snowfall extremes, in terms of intensity, they don't change as much compared to mean snowfall. And so when I made this um, type of map first, that was one of the big things I wanted to understand is why is that? Why are the extremes doing something different than the mean? Um, and the, way, the sense I mean is that their fractional change, or you could think of it as percent change in the amount of snowfall that falls, is different uh, when compared to the mean. Now, one issue with that analysis is that it's taking 20-year return values, including the whole year. But of course, um, snowfall changes throughout the winter, and you know, the, it's very seasonally dependent. So it's, in some sense, it would be better to do an analysis based on the temperature, right? Um, what is the climatological temperature for that location and that time of year, rather than just the location? And so that's what I'll do here. Um, and so I'll show you a few graphs where the horizontal axis is the climatological temperature in the control climate. So each uh, part of this axis includes many different regions, but they all have to have the same monthly uh, climatological surface air temperature 
in the control climate, not the warm climate. Um, you could do that too, but that would be, I think, confusing. And so for comparison, January in Boston is minus two. Obviously, New York could be slightly warmer. Uh, this is really cool. We're getting out to kind of Siberian temperatures here for an average temperature. And um, I don't know, Ireland or somewhere like that might be over here in, in winter uh, where we don't get much snow. OK. So here's the same results now, present, plotted versus temperature, uh, ratio of warm climate to control climate. One means no change. So again, if you're really cold to begin with, you get more seasonal snow. But as you get moved to warmer parts of the world or warmer times of year, you get down to very low fractions. Here, um, you can see that you're down to something like 20% of seasonal snowfall. Um, and this would be about, this is at the end of the end of this century with a kind of a business as usual projection. So three or four degrees Celsius warming globally. So a, a quite a plausible scenario, notwithstanding efforts to reduce emissions. And you're getting a huge decrease in the amount of snowfall you'd see, say, in January in Boston or New England. Oh, I should mention, this is for Northern Hemisphere land. Um, below 500 meters elevation. The results, uh, higher elevations are similar, but I don't understand them as well. And also, the models are less reliable there, so I'm not going to show those results. Um, now, what about the extremes? So these are now percentiles of snowfall, given here 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000, 1 in um, 10,000, 10,000. And what you see is you get quite a different curve. So this is low percentile, higher percentile, really high percentile. Um, and so <clears throat> if we pick again uh, kind of Boston or New York in January, you see the mean snowfall is in decreasing quite a lot, whereas the extremes measured by these high percentiles are not changing at all or are not changing by much. So the extremes are changing very differently uh, from the mean, and it, it becomes more so the higher, the more extreme the event you consider. So why is that? Um, well, um, there's a fairly simple explanation for part of this that's been around. Actually, I had a hard time finding it in any papers when I was working on this, but I think people understood it. Um, and that's to do with the temperature dependence of snowfall. Uh, so there's two elements here, at least. Um, one is the fraction of precipitation that falls as snow. So if it's cold enough, 100%. If it's warm enough, zero. And then there's a transition here around zero. So it can still snow, of course, if it's, say, 2 degrees Celsius at the surface, because it takes a while for um, things to melt as they fall. And now the observations for this are pretty similar, but they're shifted a bit to the right. These are from the models. Uh, so there is a lot, slight bias, but not too bad. And then when you go from the control climate to the warm climate in the model, this doesn't change much. This is to do with, um, it doesn't depend on the actual climate temperature. Uh, it's just a simple thing. And then the other thing is the precipitation rate is increasing with temperature, so including rain and snow together. As you get warmer, there's more water vapor. Other things may happen too, but overall you expect more uh, higher precipitation rates. So if you combine just those two things, you get a curve like this. And this is now based uh, not on the models, but observations. Um, so you get an optimal temperature for snowfall, um, just in terms of these factors. I'm not saying this is the only factors that affect snowfall that might relate to temperature, but those, those two factors give you an optimal temperature just below minus 2 degrees Celsius. Here, the precipitation rate is increasing the temperature, and here it's falling off because you're changing to, uh, to rain or other liquid precipitation. So there's an optimal temperature. Um, and it's the computation between increasing precipitation and decreasing snowfall fraction. Uh, if you measure it in depth of snowfall, then the density of snow on the ground will depend on the temperature. And so you get, if you just include that empirically, you get, it pushes you down to about minus 4 degrees Celsius or so. Um, and then you can worry about also microphysical effects, especially for short durations. I mentioned the microphysics earlier. Uh, things like rime splintering and other effects have temperature dependencies, so they would also affect this. But I think this is, uh, you know, the basic kind of thing that's happening. And so what is the effect of that optimal temperature? Oh, well, that's the other thing I should mention is the heavy snowfall events tend to occur near this optimal temperature. Not, not at it, 
not exactly at it, but near to it. So this graph shows that. Um, this is, again, versus the climatological temperature in the control climate, monthly temperature, versus the temperature at which the extremes occur. That's the solid line. And blue is the control climate, and red is the warm climate. So this is from the climate models again. And they occur below zero. And as you go to the higher extremes, more rare extremes, you get closer to that optimal temperature. So it's kind of an asymptotic result. Whereas mean snowfall, seasonal mean, gets contributions from all sorts of temperatures. Um, that's the basic idea. So this optimal temperature, I would argue, is more important for the extremes than the mean, the seasonal total. Um, and so what, what, what are the implications? Um, so in this paper uh, from 2014, I kind of go through the math of the thing. But the basic, basic conclusions are you would expect from this optimal temperature that if you're below it and the climate gets warm, gets warm um, you should have stronger snowfall extremes. And if you're above it for that time of year and location, as the climate gets warm, you'll get less uh, or weaker snowfall extremes. Um, now, that's kind of an asymptotic result because that means for you know, the most rare extreme, that would be true. But in practice, uh, for the kind of extremes you might deal with, the temperature uh, at which you cross over from an increase to a decrease is a bit lower. It's not minus 2 or minus 4. It's a bit lower. But it is related to this optimal temperature nonetheless. Um, okay. The other implication that's less obvious, I think, is that this dependence on the optimal temperature also is why the fractional changes in snowfall extremes become smaller the more extreme the quantity you consider. And it's harder to show why that is or say why that is, but the basic reason I've written down is down here, is that snowfall extremes are occurring at roughly the same temperature with the same humidity as the climate changes. Uh, if they're occurring at, say, minus 4 Celsius in the, in the current climate, they'll occur roughly at that temperature in the warmer climate. Whereas for rainfall extremes, um, they don't occur at the same temperature. They occur at the warmer temperature, right? And so that means more water vapor. So that's the basic difference between the two. And that leads to this result that the extremes intensity um, is, is somewhat insensitive, at least compared to mean snowfall, seasonal mean snowfall. And that means it'll be harder to detect changes in ex snowfall extremes because of this effect, and also because they're really noisy. Um, there's a lot of noise if you try to look at the, how much snowfall you get in a given location. It changes a lot from year to year. The thing to mention about that, though, is this is all about intensity of snowfall extremes. If you look at how often a certain threshold is reached, which you might care about, for example, I care about it in my house because the, it's a very old house and the furnace outlet is too low down, right? And so the snow will build up, unfortunately. And nobody wants to adjust it because they would be then liable for the furnace going wrong, I guess. And um, so there you've got a hard threshold imposed, and it's the frequency that matters, right? And so the frequency of extremes, because the PDF of precipitation or snowfall is very fast decaying, a small change in intensity can still correspond to a big change in frequency, just like for temperature is also the case. Um, and so that it depends on whether you're interested in intensity or frequency, um, this result. OK, cool. OK, so that, those were two topics. Um, the last one is going to be a little bit different. This is about convective storms, thunderstorms. How do they respond to climate change? And in particular, in particular I'm going to talk about updrafts in these uh, thunderstorms and how much energy is available for them. So how fast can they get? And this is a, a picture of a thunderstorm from, I believe, um, West Africa, as seen by the International Space Station. Uh, they take some nice pictures. Uh, just to illustrate the kind of majesty of, of some of these uh, events, especially when seen from space. Um, so <clears throat> to, to talk about this, I'm going to talk about a, a quantity that you'll see a lot uh, if you look at uh, papers about severe weather um, uh, called CAPE, uh, which stands for Convective Available Potential Energy. And this is a quantity uh, that's calculated an awful lot from uh, soundings of the atmosphere. Um, 
And it, it gives, in a sense, an upper limit on the updraft speed, how fast can updrafts be, or more precisely, the kinetic energy. So we're kind of in the best case scenario for an updraft, uh, how, how fast could it go, given the environment it finds itself in? And updraft speeds are important for precipitation rates, um, for lightning, for hail formation, and so on. You can actually write a pretty long list of why you might care about updraft speeds. So we care about updraft speeds, and we care about, we therefore care about the convective potential energy, available potential energy, the CAPE, which is not the only quantity to care about, but it is something I think is important. And <clears throat> just to give you an example, um, David Romps um, from Berkeley had a nice paper in science last year, uh, although I guess you could probably argue about some parts of it, but uh, where he was looking at, well, how does lightning change as the climate warms? And he found it becomes more frequent. And why did he find that? Well, the first thing he did was he looked at, well, what determines lightning in the US? And that's the vertical axis, the frequency of occurrence of lightning over the whole US. Um, and he found that it correlated pretty well with the CAPE, which is what we were just talking about. So if you have faster updrafts, you may form more lightning. And also the precipitation rate, and multiply those two together. And so you got a correlation of uh, R squared of 0.77, which is better than kind of previous proposals. And the idea is to get something that you can measure from the large scales in the atmosphere from, say, radio sun descents. Um, and then that is something you can say, well, in a climate model, climate models don't have lightning. But if we can say something about the CAPE uh, or the precipitation rate, maybe we can say something about lightning. And indeed, in climate models, the CAPE tends to go up in mid-latitudes. And, and so lightning frequency goes up. And that was the conclusion of the paper. But it was basically dependent on this CAPE change. The precipitation change was not a big factor. So this is one reason why we care about CAPE and why it changes. So here is a graph I made recently of the changes in CAPE um, in a global climate model simulation. And it's in June, July, August, so northern hemisphere summer. So the changes you see are mostly in that hemisphere. Um, and it's under a similar kind of scenario, climate change scenario as some of the results I showed earlier. And you can see there's a lot of red there, and that's increases. And these are pretty substantial increases in CAPE, um, including over the US. And other people have looked at this. I think Adam had a paper that includes something like this also. So CAPE seems to go up in these climate models. But I would argue that th these climate models, for the same reason they're not reliable as regards tropical precipitation extremes, they may not also be reliable about CAPE. And so we want to look into that in more detail. And so, OK. Um, one way to do this is to use a model that you do trust for things like CAPE that's more expensive to run, has a lot more resolution, a lot more grid boxes. But run it in, you can run it in a small domain to make it kind of feasible. And so that was what was done here, uh, basically a box of convection um, in a cold climate, a warm climate, and a very hot climate. And so the white is the clouds. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably a bit hard to see. But uh, one, you can even just look at this and tell that the convection is behaving differently. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. So the clouds here, let me see if I can start it again. Clouds here don't go as high. They're a bit wider, and they're not as fast. So the speed of it is actually something you can see. They just don't develop as fast as the ones in the very hot climate here, which are pretty rapid. Uh, and let's, we can then study these, this um, special atmosphere, I, very idealized. But it has a lot of the things that go on in the real atmosphere. And here's the cape as a function of the surface temperature. Each circle is a different simulation run to equilibrium, so run for a long time. And it just increases quasi exponentially with surface temperature. So this is supporting the idea that CAPE goes up. Because now we're resolving, uh, we're representing the convection well. We're actually simulating it. And the CAPE is going up uh, quite a lot. So 
Another way to look at that, uh, for those who are familiar with, with this kind of calculation, if you're not, don't worry about it too much. Um, here's the temperature profile as a function of pressure in the atmosphere as a function, and these are cold climates, warmer, warmer, very warm. And that, the solid line is the actual temperature in the simulations, and then the dashed line is what's called a moist adiabat. That's what this air parcel that's rising would experience if it didn't mix with the environment. And if you look, you can see that the dashed line is getting further away from the solid line as you go to the warmer climates going to the right. And that means that that air parcel that's rising will be warmer than the environment, buoyant, and will go up faster if there was a parcel that doesn't mix with the environment. There's a lot of mixing, but still, that's why the cape is going up. And a small change in temperature can mean a big difference for the speed at which the air rises. OK, so why does the cape go up in these simulations? Right? If we can't understand that, we're not going to be able to understand the real atmosphere. So here's our understanding. Um, we have a simple theory that's shown with this dashed line. We argue that there is a lot of mixing of clouds with their environment. Uh, we argue that the temperature of the atmosphere, its vertical structure, is close to that of a plume of kind of some rising air that mixes with the environment. Right? It's not exactly the same, but that's a pretty good estimate. And that how much the clouds are mixing with the environment doesn't change as you change the climate, or at least it doesn't change very much. But what does change, shown at the bottom here, is that the effect of that mixing on the cloud. So as you get warmer, the difference between the energy of the air inside the cloud and the energy of the air outside the cloud becomes bigger and bigger because there's a m much more water now in the cloud than outside the cloud. Uh, if the relative humidity outside this cloud doesn't change much. And so the mixing has more of an effect. Therefore, clouds that mix a lot behave much different from clouds that don't mix a lot. And therefore, the cape goes up. That's the argument. Um, and that's what this dashed line shows. Assuming the amount of mixing stays the same, but it just happens in a warmer, wetter atmosphere, and that causes the cape to go up. So we're very happy about that argument, but is that what's happening over the US? No, that's what's happening in this box. <laughs> uh, and so there's a big gap between those two that has yet to be filled in. Uh, over the US, you build up CAPE when you have things like dry lines or you know, the horizontal temperature gradients are important. The Gulf of Mexico is important, things like that that are not present here. So, but I think the combination of this graph, which is done with a model that has a lot of that stuff, plus this result suggests that that CAPE increase is real, and that's really significant um, for climate change. It's, it's, this is Cape, um, Cape and severe weather in general is quite hard to look at trends and observations because of changes in observing practices. So we're kind of relying on theory and simulations a lot. OK, I mentioned the Cape goes up. Do the updrafts become faster in this simple box? Yes, they do. So here's the cold climate. Here's the very hot climate. And here's the 99.99 .99 percentile vertical velocity. And you can see it's going, they're going much faster by a factor of two, although most of the change is in the upper troposphere, so higher up in the atmosphere. If you look in the lower part of the atmosphere, there isn't much of a change. This is over a really big range of surface temperatures. And so these changes in updrafts matter for hail and other things, I would argue, but not for the thing I started with, precipitation extremes. So even though the cape is going up, I don't think that's the explanation for intensification of precipitation extremes. It goes down to water vapor changes and also maybe larger scale circulation changes. But these updraft changes we've checked don't have, are not very big in terms of the changes in precipitation rates at the surface, even though they matter for other things like lightning, um, potentially. OK, so uh, I'll just conclude there. Um, I'll just conclude with a few slides to summarize. So the precipitation extremes is the most solid result. Observations and model, models agree on the intensification in warmer climate, although we don't know the rate in the tropics. Right? That's a pretty big caveat. A lot of people living there. Um, 
Then the snowfall extremes, uh, I just want to highlight the difference between the behavior of mean snowfall and snowfall extremes, that there might not be much change in snowfall extremes as measured by intensity uh, for kind of foreseeable near-term climate change. Um, and then lastly, um, thinking more of severe thunderstorms, what about Cape? It increases the warming global climate models and idealized cloud resolving simulations. The only exception is I think there's one climate model in which the surface humidity goes down in the Great Plains and you get a decrease uh, in Cape. But apart from that one model, it seems to increase. Uh, but the mechanism in middle latitudes uh, still needs a lot of work if we were to understand it fully. OK, thanks very much for your attention. Answer. Sure. sure okay, yeah. so we have plenty answer. of time for questions with the speaker. And so uh, please go ahead. I'll manage them and he'll answer them. Yes, yep. Angel. Hi. So can you explain to my, you know, in terms of the dynamics and your map when you are like showing the change in Cape for the future? There are places in the trough that are actually like, you know, blue. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you say something about that? Yeah, definitely. It's a good question. Uh, I'm going to try and go back to that. Oh. Where was it? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so, so basically you could think of this as how the surface uh, temperature and humidity, how they change in comparison to how temperatures higher up in the atmosphere change. And, <clears throat> you know, in places where it's going up, that surface quantity is going up by more. But um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to, right? And so uh, in general, the warming at higher levels in the atmosphere is pretty homogeneous, in the tropics at least. Uh, this is something Adam is kind of famous for studying. Um, but the surface changes can be quite inhomogeneous. And so over the ocean, you can get less or more warming, less or more humidity change. And that can explain that kind of pattern. And um, for the, particularly for the humidity change, over land, you, I know you asked about ocean, that, that could depend on what's happening to plants, vegetation, and so forth. So it, it, it definitely is not a foregone conclusion that you would get an increase in Cape in any given region. But nonetheless, it's kind of remarkable. You know, it was actually a good question to ask about the blue blob, but it's kind of amazing how much red there is in that graph. Yeah. It's also interesting that in the southern hemisphere, basically it's a zero, no changes. That is. Well, yeah. So, yeah. So the thing about this is um, that would depend on. S this is the season is one thing, and also how you calculate this. The reason I calculated this is people had done it in the literature before, but I was worried about their calculations because they'd often use monthly fields, a monthly average, which isn't really useful over land because uh, of the diurnal cycle, and so I did this with like four times daily data. And sometimes there will be just zero cape. And you can't really tell from that, you know. I mean, this is then averaged in time, so there'll be some contribution. But um, yeah, so there, but the main reason is that it's JJA. Yeah, thank you, though. Yes. Uh, Paul, I want to return to the snow issue. My understanding is that the climate models still don't know so much, sorry. My understanding is the climate models still don't sort of know so much about mountains, and, and they don't see fine scale or graphic details very well. Yeah. Uh, that's potentially really important. For example, the whole water storage system of California is based on snowfall in the Sierra Nevada, right, that then yeah. melts and fills up the dams in the spring. What do your results tell us that uh, to sort of first order we should be thinking about systems like that where, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 million people are dependent on a certain amount of snow in the winter? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let me go back uh, just to have a graph to look at. But, I mean, I would argue that first snowfall, um, the, the models I used were inadequate for the regions with a lot of topography just for the reason that they didn't have enough resolution, right? So they're just not adequately represented. Um, 
And what happens if you do use a model that has higher resolution for mean snowfall, I don't know about extremes, is that you, you tend to, it's, it's, it's simple in a way, right? You just start to resolve the mountains, and then you get higher elevations, lower temperatures, so you start to see more regions where snowfall increases. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, over Greenland, there's an increase, right? Because the model can represent Greenland, but, you know, that would be true in other mountain ranges too. Uh, so that's a way in which it changes. Um, the second thing I'll say about mountains is that they're very interesting for extreme precipitation in general, not just snowfall. Um, there are results, only a handful of people looked at this, but basically it seems that the change in percentile change, or percent change, fractional change, in precipitation extremes is bigger on the lee side of mountains. And nobody can quite agree why that is. But uh, uh, it's a very interesting result and could do to mountain wave dynamics maybe is what explains it. Uh, so I think I would just say more generally then we need to study uh, orographic precipitation extremes more, uh, but it is a challenging area for sure. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you chose to focus in on all these thermodynamic processes how changes in the frequency and intensity of these circulation events change uh, yeah yeah I think I think that's fair I think in mid latitudes um, clearly there's you know if, if something like a storm track shifts you'll you'll have an effect of that. What's remarkable to me is that in the middle latitudes, the circulation doesn't change more, actually. <laughs> and by circulation, I mean now the, what matters for these extremes is how fast the air is rising. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's an emergent result that it doesn't change more just in general. I'm not even talking about details of where, say, high pressures and so forth are located. Um, yeah, so. I would say it's an emergent result that there isn't big changes in the circulation compared to the, the thermodynamic changes. Uh, there are, there's no reason to think that for the tropics. So the results we have, to the extent we have results on it, they, it does change. So I think the circulation change does matter for the precipitation extremes there. But I think there is evidence that it doesn't change too much in the extratropics. And actually, even when you have a poleward shift in the storm track, it's hard to see the imprint of that in a model on the, on the precipitation extremes. Um, so it's, it's a little bit surprising, but that just seems to be what's happening. Uh, I think it's fluid dynamical in nature why that is. Uh, so it's, somebody could explain it, uh, but nobody, I have a, in a review, review I wrote um, recently, I was gonna mention that actually, if I included it. Oh, take a while to get there. Uh, yeah, which Adam has organized a, uh, a whole section of reviews. Um, in that review, I argued, I gave an explanation for why maybe the vertical velocities in the extropics don't change, but um, remains to be seen, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Others? Yes, Andrew. Just to follow on, on, on Richard's question, I mean, it, say, it says nothing about the organization, right? You're talking about the, the rates, the, the rain rates essentially instantaneously. Right. But the, the duration could be longer or I mean, right. in terms of a flooding event, you could have yes. more organization that would, it, would, yes. would uh, determine the, yeah. the uh, yeah. seriousness of the flooding. Right, so I think uh, duration of precipitation extremes is, is clearly really important. Um, we did, I have looked at that, um, for convective precipitation, and um, we did find some changes in duration. Uh, I'm thinking now of short term, like five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour versus a day, which may be not what you're thinking of, so that would be relevant to flash flooding maybe. And there were some changes in duration, but they depended a lot on the microphysics, uh, how ice was treated in the model. So, uh, so I would say we don't know to the extent that we can't treat ice well. Um, for lar longer time scales and larger scale systems, um, I have a postdoc who's been looking a bit at duration changes. So one reason to think there might be duration changes is that the speed of the jet stream changes. So as you warm the climate, 
uh, depending on where you are, but it, it may, the westerlies will weaken, essentially. And so the simplest picture would be the westerlies weaken, the systems propagate slower, and you get longer duration events. And some people have even argued that based on um, our Arctic sea ice that this induces, you probably hear, heard about this, that you know, declines in Arctic sea ice warm the Arctic, uh, weaken the polar equator temperature gradient, weaken the westerlies, uh, and then that would lead to more extreme events uh, in terms of duration. Um, but I can say that that does not happen in climate models. And um, I, I think that effect is there, but it's very small. The weakening of the westerlies is not so big, for example. And there are other reasons for change in duration. And I think it would be fair to say that the papers that have argued for this mechanism uh, in terms of observations, uh, I don't know how to put this, um, they were wrong, I guess. It's a, <laughs> you know, I would argue. I mean, that's probably, that's an oversimplification. I would say that they're not wrong. But I don't know of any evidence that I believe for this mechanism currently. But it's not to say it, it's not true, uh, for sure. But uh, I don't think we have evidence for it. It uh, would be very interesting dynamically. I would be really interested if that happened. Uh, I think there are changes in duration, but uh, we can't, uh, they're, they're not explainable in this simple way, as far as I can tell. Thank you. We we'll take a couple more. Yes. Uh, you get the tropical extreme view after you uh, put your observational constraint, the uncertainty decline is quite high. Um, yeah. yeah. For models, we know that maybe it's parameterization issues, but for observations, what would be easier? Yeah, sorry, let me go back to this. Is this, yeah. yeah. So the gray band is still high even after you constrain the model. Yeah, so when you say it's high, do you mean it's wide or do you mean it? Oh, wide, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, so there's kind of two aspects of that. Uh, one is I have to relate the kind of shorter term variability to the longer term climate change in the models. And those are related, pretty strongly related. If a model is super sensitive to, in terms of its precipitation extremes to long term warming, it's also super sensitive to El Nino. You can just look at the time series and you'll see it. But that's not a perfect relationship. Uh, and so that explains part of the spread. And then the one that you can probably deal with more in a way is the observed uh, response of precipitation extremes to El Nino, which in this case came from satellite estimates of precipitation, uh, the best of which are pretty s short time series. So if we had a longer time series, that would shrink that. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I would say that, that is a 90% confidence interval. Yeah, unfortunately, I guess it's still wide, uh, but I'm not sure I envision it getting too much narrower in the future. The only good thing to say is that it's much narrower than kind of what the model spread had indicated originally. Um, yeah. OK. Yes, yeah, sir. Josh. Paul, oh, the, uh, the updraft increasing by almost a double day moving from up to near the tropopause. Yeah. Is, and you mentioned that's an idealized model. I yeah. appreciate that. And the next step would say, look at continental US, look at Europe, where hail yeah, occurs. Right. Is there any observational, even just looking at radioson data, that updraft speeds are trending upward with time, either upward in velocity or upward in the atmosphere, looking at a radioson network? Uh, for upward, I don't know of anything uh, that would show that. I mean, for sure, people have tried to look at trends in these things. Uh, probably in a longer talk, I would have included a bit more about that. Um, but I think for like incidents of severe weather, I'm not expert on that, but my feeling is the, the tr it's very hard to look at the trends because the kind of how they were reported has changed, uh, so it's con confounding. Uh, but you can, uh, the updrafts directly, I don't think you look at, but you can look at the CAPE change, and people have done that, and there are some changes. Um, I just don't know how reliable they are. To give you a comparison, um, there's a long-standing controversy in climate science about the hot spot in the tropical upper troposphere. It's very strongly related to the question of like, what happens to the Cape. And um, is there a, a hot spot of warming in the tropics, uh, say, you know, eight or nine kilometers up? And that's been going on for a long time. And 
you know, you end up with the radio sounds, you end up adjusting. Uh, you have to adjust for when they change the radio sound, um, uh, things like that. And people make good efforts. Uh, one recently by Steve Sherwood where he used Krigging, which is a standard method. Um, and that does show that tropical upper troposphere hotspot in the tropics. Uh, in the middle latitudes, we have a lot more radio sounds, so and that's positive. Um, particularly for the US, there might be some hope. But um, yeah, uh, I, I think CAPE maybe for the updrafts directly, I don't know of any data that would give you that. Uh, so we're kind of left. That's why people are trying to use proxies like CAPE and wind shear. And um, what they find is that you do get increases in the frequency of severe thunderstorm environments in spring and probably in uh, summer too. So, so that, that would be consistent with what I've said. Yeah. Well, for the, since we have a range of backgrounds, we're saying the radio sounds, of course, don't measure the updraft yeah. speed. Radio sounds or weather balloons don't actually right. measure the updraft speed directly, so it's hard to do it. Yeah, so. yeah there are sta some stations that will give you updraft speed by other methods, but not long enough to give you a trend, I think. Yeah. So I have one about the snow. Oh, yeah, so, sure. So the, you, you look at the different percentiles and how they depend on temperature as a function of the mean temperature, but presumably, given the argument about the optimal, that, that it's daily snowfall and that you have this argument about the optimal temperature, which makes sense and everything, presumably what it really depends on is something about the PDF, the distribution of temperatures and how often you have precipitation on an optimal yes. day. And yes. the mean temperature is sort of encoding that. I mean, there's, right. Right. that would only be a perfect way of binning things if, if the whole distribution of temperatures were the same for every yeah, mean temperature. Yeah. So it's still possible, that, isn't it, that there's some sort of richer spectrum of behavior where you could have somewhere that is not that cold, such that snowfall, mean snowfall goes down pretty sharply as you warm, but that every once in a while you get that Arctic blast and you have, right. you know, and then yeah. it's your extremes could even be going up at temperatures that are different than, I mean, have you right. thought all about that yeah. range of variability? And yeah, I think so. Yeah, regimes yeah like I think the PDF, the probability distribution of temperatures is likely to change, uh, right? And that I think would fit in with what you're saying and then there would be a, a knock-on result. Um, I guess uh, I was asking more about just geographic variability. Ah. Uh, Sorry, how do you mean by geographic? Well, two places could yeah. have the same mean temperature, but different frequency of ah, yeah. cold snaps or, or For sure, something. yeah. I see, yeah. I mean, I guess the question would be, as long as the distribution, yeah, OK. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. the mean temperature change is, is not adequate. Yeah, I, that's true. Um, and. It would be good. It is true that the distribution of temperature, if you've ever looked at the temperature distribution of a given weather station, is definitely not Gaussian, uh, for example. So I haven't looked at that, but yeah, I think that's a reasonable uh, thing to look at. There would be two questions. What is the distribution in the first place? And then does it just shift to warmer temperatures? Or does it change shape? And, um, and yeah, both would be you know, interesting. Or, or I guess what I was wondering is whether some particular place could be in one point on the mean, you know, it could have a given mean temperature, but behave in terms of how the extremes change more yeah. like somewhere else on the curve because right. it, you know. Yeah, so yeah, I guess the thing to do would be, you could just say, look at the probability distribution around where the optimal temperature is, and then you could map it out uh, pretty easily, which I haven't done, but I think that would be reasonable, yeah. Okay, before we lose team, yeah. Mike. Since you happen to have this slide up, I thought maybe I'll ask this question. Sure. Um, so going from La Nina to El Nino, you have multiple things, of course, going on. One is the tropical mean warming, but you also have the redistribution of precipitation from land to ocean. And yeah. I just wonder, would that matter in this type of analysis and using the response to El right. Nino to constrain the response to Yeah, yeah, that's a change? really good question. Um, so yeah, another way of saying that is El Nino gets a bit warmer overall, but it's not like global warming. A lot of other stuff changes. And uh, so what I find in this analysis is what the sensitivity of precipitation extremes to warming is very different for El Nino compared to global warming. So there's about a factor of two difference. And so I think that's because of the kind of things you're saying. And in fact, I found you have to use changes over the ocean rather than over land to get a, a signal. So the sensitivity is very different. and. Um, 
that's sometimes not appreciated, that you can't just use variability, say day-to-day -day variability or El Nino to infer what's going to happen for climate warming. But in this case, as long as you, there's still a relationship, I guess, right? That like if models are super sensitive in the precipitation extremes response, uh, for one thing, there will be for the other, even though the relationship is not one-to-one. -one. And so that was what was used in this, in this paper. Uh, but I, I think it's a good point. Uh, a similar issue occurs for daily versus hourly precipitation extremes. People have noticed that if you look at uh, measurements of precipitation uh, every hour at, say, somewhere in the first paper like this was in Holland, that uh, the dependence on temperature of the rainfall is twice as big for hourly extremes as for daily extremes. And so that's a really interesting result. It suggests maybe hourly extremes are more sensitive, but it's for day-to-day -day variability or hour-to-hour -hour variability. There's still a big jump to how that um, occurs under longer-term climate change. Um, yeah. Okay, so things are slowing down. So why don't we take one more, and then we can let it go to general uh, discussion. If anybody has one more they'd like to ask Paul. Going once, going twice. Okay, let's call it there. So we we have the room, you know, for another half an hour or something till two, whatever that is. So um, feel free to hang around, have another cookie if there's any left, and uh, we can discuss extremes um, with Paul or or amongst ourselves. But uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, and Paul especially. Okay, thanks. Thank you.